Welcome to ABA Inside Track, the podcast that's like reading in your car, but safer. I'm your host, Robert Perry Cruz, and with me as always are my fabulous co-hosts. Hey, Rob, it's Diana. And it's me, Jackie, demoted to the number three <laughs> spot yet again. I, you know, I have called shotgun for I'm the sorry, year 2023. You know, we didn't record them. We did our performance reviews and everybody said no one can say, hey, everybody quite like me. So I got to stay in the top slot. <laughs> Jackie, you know, is the feedback not as good, so we had to put oh, you in. I'm so sorry. You know, it's, it's, not it's, true. it's how it I goes. <laughs> <laughs> that's not true. We're just taking turns. No, how about okay? I'll love, instead, the feedback was we loved hearing you come in at the end, that mellifluous tone. We liked that like, at the you end. Sing it like the John Raffio on Parks and Rec. Because yeah, because usually yeah, because you do the John Raffio. That's exactly why. That's that's what that's what they said. That's HR. Don't look at me. You know, I just I just work here. <laughs> but welcome. You might be wondering if this is some sort of advice business podcast. Actually, it's a Parks and Rec podcast. Or Parks and Rec podcast. It's neither of those. This is a podcast right. about behavior analysis and behavior analytic research, where every week we pick a topic related to the field and discuss some interesting articles on that topic. And sometimes we pick a topic that it's so far outside our realm of competence that we have to say, who do we know that is leading the field, is publishing on this? does it every day, lives and breathes this topic, and then say, please, please, please come on our on our podcast. And we're very lucky that the call was answered. I just want you to know that I have been fangirling these wonderful people for five years and kept being like, do you want to be on the show? Do you want to be on the show? Hey, do you want to be on the show? 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 And finally- no, Jackie, that's toxic. That's toxic insane. fandom, Jackie. You can't wear down- <laughs> Your guests <laughs> until they finally say yes. That's not romantic or well, anything. Came to Jackie McDonald. Oh boy! Well, we better introduce our fabulous guests. We are going to be talking with Dr. Miranda Traha and Amanda Ripley about behavioral gerontology, or as, as we're calling it, because we did this topic episode one episode. Episode fifty-six. Yes, this is behavioral gerontology revisited now with updated okay. stats and figures. But so, better. Mar- Miranda and Amanda, thank you so much, and welcome to the show. Thank you. Hi. Thank you so much for having us. We're very grateful to be here today. Well, we are very excited. This is a topic I think all three of us, anytime we hear about it, we are so excited. There are people in behavior analysis who are working hard in this field. I know there's a lot of people outside behavior analysis as well working hard in this field, but you know, for our for you know our audience, that's the kind of where the focus is. And it's something that I think all of us have said, I wish I could do that. Oh, we, maybe we should change gears completely. So it is such a treat to have you both on. We're going to be talking about some articles. And we also had the chance to take some of your recently, pretty recently published courses on the subject of behavioral gerontology. So we are all coming with lots of knowledge, just enough to get into trouble. So we're very glad you're here to help us out of any trouble we might get into by uh, misspeaking. So thank you both. Do you want to, why do you just want to tell us what, what, how they can get your CEs right now? And then we'll do it at the end too, but because they're so good. Oh, absolutely. So you can check us out at www.abilities.today slash learn. And that will take you to the six CEs that we have available right now. And one is actually a free one. It's called all the places you can go a survey of ABA in gerontology. Ooh, going to take that one tonight. <laughs> Excellent. And I did one on an intro into ethics in uh, dementia care, which I did not know how little I knew about dementia care until I learned about the ethics that I wouldn't be following. But luckily for me, I wasn't practicing <laughs> dementia care. So I was okay. Whew, I was close. That's good. You got that one in under the wire. I was, I was just about to start my dementia care business. And then I watched the talk and I realized I had a lot to do still. So I, I, I put that's on the back burner. Maybe another time. Nice. And mine was on assessments related to dementia care and behavioral gerontology. And I also learned a ton. So now you can probably do assessments. Nope. I, st- I, still, I am still outside of my scope. No, of okay. Yes. Well, together we can start our business. We just got to keep working <laughs> at it, right? And I, I am working through Dementia 101. I will get it done soon. My life's Excellent. a hot mess. And just to mention, we also have a couple others, one called Starting Your Own ABA Practice in Dementia Care. And then we have our fifth one that hasn't been mentioned yet, or I guess this would be our sixth one, is Grub-A-Dub-Dub Shower Routines in Dementia. So shower 
uncooperative behavior during shower routines is often a referral into our services. Or if it's not the primary referral, once we're in the home and met some other goals, we realize showering and bathing and grooming Mm -hmm. becomes a challenge for the individuals that we serve. So we created a whole CE course on just shower routines. That's good. I should have listened to the intro to starting your business first, I think, before the ethics. Or maybe I, maybe I did it right, so I learned that I was I was way behind on my prep work. So Those two Either really way. do go together. They're, they're supplementing each other. You know, we, we wanted to have an ethics CE, and then we also wanted to have just the practice components. And so we really advise if you take one that you take the other because those really do go hand in hand with each other. Oh, good. Well, luckily for me, I was just preparing for a podcast, so I think I think I'll be okay. But it was very Absolutely. interesting to just see how much you know additional information there was, how things you know how this field is tied into you know so many important parts of behavior analysis. So I think it was a lot of fun and very educational. And we've also got two articles that we'll be talking about. Do you want to share those? I sure do. So our guests have provided us with two articles that we're going to talk about for this episode, and these are both really like kind of survey articles of the field of behavioral gerontology. One is an oldie, but a goodie. And one is a newie, but a goodie. And the oldie is titled Behavioral Gerontology, Application of Behavioral Methods to the Problems of Older Adults. That's by Bergio and Bergio, published in Java in 1986. Wow. I know. And then our newie is Behavioral Interventions or First-Line Treatments for Managing Changes Associated with Cognitive Decline by Drossel and Traha. And that was published in The Behavior Therapist 2015. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yes, I think so. I think so, too. That's what I had in the notes. Okay, very good. Good. Exciting stuff. So I think, you know, we've talked a little bit about certainly your company. We've talked generally about the work that you do. We haven't talked about the two of you and how you got into this field. So we'd love to hear kind of your own journeys and your own stories about who you are and how you came into the field of behavioral gerontology. Okay, great, wonderful. So my name is Miranda, and I'm a clinician for Challenging Behaviors. I've been working in the field since the early 2000s, and specifically in dementia care since 2007. And I've practiced in multiple states, in multiple settings, and with various diagnoses. I'm originally from South Louisiana and went to LSU and took my first ABA class as an undergrad. And I remember immediately falling in love with our science. But I said out loud in that class, there is no way I'm going into gerontology. And then I went to grad school at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, and that's where I met Amanda as well as Jackie. And Amanda was actually doing some work at a nursing home, and I went to observe what it was like to do what she's doing out there. And I was really overwhelmed by what I saw and what I heard and what I felt when I walked into that facility. And then I saw Amanda walk over to a senior who was crying really hard and Amanda used her tools to calm her down and redirect her to an activity. And I was just so amazed in that moment how quickly Amanda could change behavior. And I realized there's so much work that could be and needed to be done with seniors. And so after that semester, I essentially chose my specialty and learned as much as I could about senior care at the with the time that I had left at SIU. And then I gained so much knowledge about the biopsychosocial bio-psych- aspects of aging during my postdoc at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine and Geriatric in gerontology. And there I real I realized that I really wanted to be a clinician in the field, but at that time no one was hiring for a BCBA in gerontology. So I created my own company, which I started in Florida, which is the state with the highest percentage of seniors in America right now. And I was in Florida for about five years, and I built a pretty strong ABA in dementia care business with memory care clinics referring to me. I partnered with a large senior living community that allowed students at local universities to gain research experience. And we ran clinical plans that we implemented with the residents that were on site. We had an immersion program for BCBAs who could stay on site, hear lectures from us. And they got to watch and help run therapy sessions. So the immersion program really was a full hands-on experience. But sometimes other factors are at play besides the job. I love the location and the work that we were doing. But my partner and I didn't have close social connections. We didn't really know anyone there or have a support network built. So we decided to move closer to family and move back to Southern Illinois in 2018. 
which actually was a blessing because now I get to work at the same company as one of my closest friends, Amanda, and we spend time collaborating and consulting on aging-related activities. We currently see private pay clients at home or in senior living communities, and we're like we mentioned before, we're rolling out several continuing education credits for BCBAs looking to expand their practice into gerontology. That's great. And Amanda, how about how about you? Similar similar track, different differences in locations for a long time, it sounds like, or at various points. Definitely. I found gerontology in kind of a, actually a whole different way. So I grew up in Chicago, in the suburbs of Chicago, and I went to undergrad at Western Michigan University. Most of the practicum experiences that they had at Western had to do with working with children with autism. And I've just never been very interested in working with children with autism. And so I looked for other different types of opportunities. And that's when I found Dr. LeBlanc and Dr. Jonathan Baker. And I worked under them as a in their undergraduate practicum where we worked with individuals with intellectual disabilities who also had a dementia diagnosis in a day program like setting. I really liked this population and the work. So I extended that practicum there and I spent a couple more years supervising newer students and having a bigger hand in assessment from there after I graduated. Then I went down to Southern Illinois for my master's degree. I worked under several different professors at SIU, most notably Dr. Dixon and Dr. Davis, which I think really helped guide my skills and experience just working with different professionals within the gerontology field. I also worked at a state-operated facility for adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities, and I had an internship and practical experiences in nursing homes. And then also, because you can't get away with you know, getting your master's degree, I also did work with children with autism. (laughs) can't get around it, really. You're like, I thought I got away from it, but no. <laughs> no, you just can't. You just can't. <laughs> so then after I graduated, I moved to Colorado and worked with adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities as a community behavior analyst. And I, you know, really when I was looking for positions, there just wasn't any positions working with seniors as a behavior analyst. And mm-hmm. I did the next best thing, honestly, which was you know, working in the community with adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And luckily, because this population is also their ages are increasing, medical care is so great, they're living longer and have issues with dementia, that I've had many, many cases with adults with intellectual disabilities who also have a dementia diagnosis. Similar to Miranda, though, I was pulled back to Southern Illinois. I spent I spent four years in Colorado before moving back. And then I've worked for this company, Trinity Services, since 2013 in a variety of positions. I've been a, I'm a community BCBA. I work for our crisis team. I also do work in a school. So I work in it within a school district and I get to still work with seniors. I really like the variety of billing and all the populations. And my company really allows for that growth and flexibility. That's always good to hear. Yeah, (laughs) that's awesome. So a, a question that I, I think now that we kind of heard, you know, your origins, the populations you've worked with, that I, I kind of want us to start the the bigger discussion or the broader discussion is, how, how do you define behavioral gerontology? Like, like where did this field come from? I, I know we've had aging and we've had dementia for a very long time and intellectual impairments, you know, that's that's been known forever. But how did like behavior analysis start getting involved in in this field? So I think when you want to talk about behavior gerontology, we also need to go over some terminology like geriatrics and gerontology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Amanda, will you tell us a little bit about geriatrics? Absolutely. So geriatrics is a branch of medicine, a branch of internal medicine that specifically focuses on the health and care of elderly people. It aims mainly to promote health and to diagnose, prevent, and treat diseases and disabilities in older adults. Geriatric focuses on the medical aspects of aging. There are specialties in geriatrics like geriatric psychiatry, geriatric neurology, and geriatric surgery. Yeah, what's the age that you would be an older adult? Oh, that's a good question. So it depends on who's asking, to be quite honest. So if it's Social Security, it might be 65 or 67. If you're a person with intellectual disabilities, it might be 50 or 55. So 
older adult is really defined by the audience. Cool. Thanks. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Like when you have geriatric par- pregnancy and you're only like 15. That's I'm right. just kidding. But That's a like, great example. 35. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Cool. So gerontology is different in that it's a multidisciplinary study that looks at the process of aging, and it looks at the impacts of that biology, psychology, and sociology on older adults. So gerontology is the process of aging itself, and it people study from cells and tissues to the attainment of maturity all the way till death. And gerontologists study all the factors that influence a lifespan change. So really, behavior gerontology is a subspecialty of ABA, and it's simply the application of behavior analysis to aging-related issues. Do you want me to give like a little background on where behavior gerontology came from in our literature? We'd love to That'd hear that, great. yes. So if you look at behavior gerontology in the ABA literature, in 1964, Ogden Lindley was the first behaviorist to say, hey, behavior researcher, let's get into aging because there's issues that we can solve. And then you start seeing in the 70s and 80s, the works of Elise Pinkston and Nathan Lynx assessing and implementing home-based behavioral interventions for families. In the 80s and 90s, you'll find people like Dwayne Lundervold and Louis Lewin. They did behavior therapy work in nursing homes. And at that same time, you'll find many, many works by Lou Bergio and his colleagues. In the mid-1990s is when B.F. Skinner put out his book called Enjoy Old Age, a, pa- a Practical Guide. And that lists several antecedent interventions that a senior can do to maintain his or her or they quality of life. I love that book, Miranda. Yeah, so it really is such a wonderful, easy to read, very simple, very practical recommendations. Oh, I just love, love, love it. I read it. I got it for a present once. Someone bought it for me, and I was reading it, and I was like, I'm going to do this right now. I'm going to start preparing. And yeah. I like, <laughs> I, I referenced it in like a lot of classes. We just did a, a work-life balance talk somewhere and I reference it in there. It's like my, one of my favorite Skinner books. Yeah. It I really is a great book. I love that you got it as a gift though. I feel like someone yeah. was telling you something. <laughs> like, you're looking, Ooh. you're looking a little run down, Jackie. Here's a book that might help yeah. you out. Yeah. I got it as like a birthday present, which is hilarious. <laughs> it was a romantic anniversary gift. <laughs> I think oh, it was cool. Rob, which is hilarious. <laughs> Only. Yeah. That's yeah. That, that I, I would believe it, Jackie. That does. <laughs> so if the listeners are looking for some newer references, well, the first place I would direct them is to our free online CE, a survey of ABA and gerontology, because there we have a 14-page reference list. But today's names to look for would be Dr. Jonathan Baker, Claudia Drossel, Lilani Feliciano, Chris Walmsley, and some colleagues across the pond, which include Rebecca Sharp, Zoe Lecoq, and Hannah Steinem. And outside of ABA, I really encourage people to look at Lou Bergio's REACH program, and that's Resources for Enhancing Alzheimer's Caregiver Health, and Linda Terry's STAR program, which is staff training in assisted living residents. They're not behavior analysts, but they do behavior analytic work. Awesome. Excellent. It's a good. Th- it's a good thorough background. We really appreciate that. So when it, when it comes to you know some of the work that you do, and I, I know that you know the, there's a wide range of work. I'm sure you're collaborating with lots of folks. One of the key areas seems to be the change over the lifespan of sort of you know increased behavioral excesses or problem behavior in the elderly or, or deficits. Perhaps is is the better term. When you're thinking about kind of conceptualizing these challenges. It's just behavior, right? I mean, does it, is it is that big a deal that it's with a with an elder, you know, individual versus with a child, or are there you know really concepts that you need to tweak more for that population? Right, right. So behavior is behavior. You're totally right about that. But what stands out in senior care are those longer histories of reinforcement, the variability of reinforcement and experiences in a life, just how frail that person is. And then, in, and then also thinking about the social or face validity of interventions, especially things like escape extinction or giving candy or food or using yeah. baby dolls or things that are toys or, you know, what might be considered kind of 
age inappropriate, what, but what actually functions as a soothing item for this older adult. Pushing for more natural and within context interactions just is a little less contrived. I mean, I'm not usually running discrete trial trainings with my senior, but then I also see that in other fields too, just kind of really pushing toward the less contrived and the more natural type of strategies. So I think there's a lot of similarities and things that you can pull from. Mm-hmm. And just to piggyback on Amanda's answer, we also believe that, you know, if you're raised with a disability, you're kind of used to getting help from a young age. Whereas if you're an older adult without a developmental disability, you're brand new at getting support in everyday life, like especially around those ADLs, those activities of daily living. So there's really more resistance to asking for help and receiving help. Mm -hmm. Now we see there's a climate cultural change that's happening with younger people asking for help at a younger age and, you know, welcoming and receiving help, at least in regards to mental health. But in but it hasn't made that switch in our senior population. That shift in paradigm hasn't really affected sure. them yet. So they do have a difficult time accepting help. Another big difference in working with kids versus seniors is the idea for about planning or talking about death. Death and dying are a natural part of being human, and we just don't broach that subject a lot with kids or even middle-aged adults. But as you can imagine, we're talking about or referring to death much more in senior care. And then there are two more areas that we wanted to mention where we see some differences between kids and seniors. And that first one is around assent or consent and the power dynamics around family members. Because kids are raised to follow rules and obey their parents, right? But in senior care, those same kids are in charge of making decisions about their parents. And this can be a totally new and different concept for those adult children that we work with. And lastly, our ABA services are not usually about getting better or increasing skills. With kids, we're talking about learning and increasing skill sets, right? Increase, increase, increase. But in senior care, we're really talking about maintaining skills. And much more is about maintaining that person's quality of life today. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. So when we talk about aging, Jackie's all ready to go. You know, she can't wait to be a senior. She can't, she can't wait. I already (laughs) am a senior. Okay. (laughs) Okay. She's, she's already living the lifestyle. If you know, folks can't can't see at home, but she's got her great. She's got her Afghan. She's got her tea. (laughs) Whereas like for me, I don't want to think about aging. I wouldn't even see that movie old about the beach that turns you old. Cause that's what's like the scariest monster that, that I could ever think of. And then in, in, in reading the articles that you shared, it, it just felt like this sort of cascading event of all of these factors that we don't really think of when we just kind of generally think of like, oh, yeah, you get old, yeah, you get a little slower, your, you know, your muscles, your bones are weaker. Mm-hmm. But there seem to be so many factors specific to aging that, you know, they, they don't sound like much on their own necessarily, but mm-hmm. thinking about their impact on behavior, I, I kind of, you don't certainly need to go through every factor, but I'd love to hear some of the ones that maybe either you are always surprised by or that are just the most impactful in terms of how the aging process just changes behavior, just shifts it completely. Or related to that quality of life. That yeah. I know saying, yeah. So I think that one thing that really stands out in your question is that I mean, it kind of speaks to that it's kind of depressing to get older, right? And, you know, that really, when Miranda and I were prepping for this, that really stuck out to us. Because if anyone would imply that, you know, a different field like autism or being born with an intellectual disability is depressing, Mm -hmm. you know, family or people in communities, I mean, they'd be infuriated and offended, right? right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And aging really is the same. How you... Mm -hmm. and it. It really is about, as a behavior analyst, finding strength in aging. And there's just so much more to a person than aging or their aging-related issues. And we think that this is a culturally culturally reinforced process, that aging is so depressing. And in our culture, when everything is anti-aging, getting older is so stigmatized, even though it affects every single one of us. So it makes sense to hear that you or some of you out there Think that aging is depressing. No, it's me. I said, I'll, I'll, I'll own that, Miranda. It's very depressing. I'm very scared of the process. You're not sure. the only one, though. You really are. It. <laughs> I promise to learn and reflect. I hear everything you're saying, but I, I'm not, I, I won't back down from that original, the original opinion. It's very scary. <laughs> sure. But when you, put that, 
I'll change it, but I'll own up that I have it. <laughs> sure. But when you put that into context and when we look at the environment that influences that thought process, then, you know, we get why you think that for sure. Aside from that, there really are some medical and healthcare issues that can significantly impact a senior. A fall, a chronic condition can severely change the direction of that person's care plan and their quality of life. Their wellness plan can really affect the life of an individual. Yes, we're talking about diet and exercise, but we're also talking about a person's spiritual and emotional wellness can significantly impact how a person processes aging. So if you're a person that does not accept the reality of aging, or you can't find joy and gratitude in your daily life, then yes, aging will look quite depressing to you. And Amanda and I actually talk to so many seniors who feel this way. And it's part Mm -hmm. of our job to use ABA interventions to influence that perspective. Man, there sure is a lot to learn about this field. But before we learn even more, let's take a quick break and then we'll be right back talking about behavioral gerontology. Do you want to be a BCBA? Sure, we all do. Now you can come to Regis College in Weston, Mass to get your graduate degree. Choose from any one of these courses. Master's of Science in Applied Behavior Analysis. Master's of Science in Special Education. Dual degree in Special Ed and ABA. Or be eligible for your post-master's certificate. You can complete your degree and be ready to sit for the exam in two years. And our 2017 grads had a 100% pass rate on the BACB exam. Come enjoy practicum placement support, ethics mini handbooks, PhD level professors, small class sizes, and a service trip to Iceland. If interested, don't delay. Supplies are limited. Learn more at regiscollege.edu. Again, that's www.regiscollege.edu, regiscollege.edu. One more time, www.regiscollege.edu. See you there. And we are back talking about behavioral gerontology with Dr. Miranda Traha and Amanda Ripley. But before we continue with our discussion, I want to remind all of our listeners out there that ABA Inside Track is ACE and Quava approved. By listening, you're able to earn one learning CE. All you need to do is finish listening. Then go to the link in your podcast player to get to our website, abainsidetrack.com slash get CEUs to purchase CEs for this episode. You're also going to need two secret code words. These are secret guest code words this week from Miranda and Amanda. And the first of those is joy, J-O-Y. Whether you are thinking of the concept of immense happiness or the dishwashing liquid, just as long as you spell J-O-I, you're good to go. All right, now let's get back to talking behavioral gerontology. So I, I think one of the other pieces that I always think is interesting about you know, the idea of a behavior analyst working in the in gerontology is so much of what we think of as geri- you know, is geriatrics, right? You know, I, I didn't even th- I couldn't even think the term being different. So much of what we think of with aging has to do with well, you go to the doctor, the internal medicine folks, they give you the pills because you're getting old and you need those pills to survive. And they, you know, maybe they give you some physical therapy to help with your mobility, and that's all you need. And then eventually, you know, we we shuffle off this mortal coil. Is there something about, you know, being kind of, to some extent, you know, behavior analysts being kind of outsiders to the model that's been around for so long that, you know, has been, you felt maybe like counterproductive or like you've come in with a new sort of vision of like, well, this is how we can think of aging that's different than the medical, the medical model has responded? Well, that's a really good question. And the medical model has responded the best way that they know how, which is prescribing medications. I don't want to pass judgment on the medical model because the primary reason why we have so many seniors now is because that medical model has done such a good job at combating Mm -hmm. chronic health conditions. Finding these medical miracles to cures and illnesses would have resulted in an earlier death. So we are serving more seniors. And because seniors are living longer, the prevalence of dementia is increasing. One of the most problematic 
issues is behavior and psychology symptoms, which includes things like wandering, mood changes, disruptive vocalizations, and uncooperative behaviors. The medical model is stuck in how to deal with that because they want to help our families, but they don't understand how the environment influences behavior because that's not their expertise, right? It's ours. So yeah. now is the time that everyone needs to pull together their expertise, the medical model as well as behaviorists to solve some of these behavior-related issues related to aging. I thought it was really noteworthy too in the, I think the, the Drossel article, it said any behavioral challenges that you see should First, before you do anything else, look to see if they're medication related. Mm-hmm. Oh, 100%. I hadn't thought, hadn't thought of that. But that Some of the seniors that we're working sense. with, they're on 10, 15, 20 medications and supplements. Right. So Amanda yeah. and I are always, let's look at this medication. We're not assessing the medication list, right? But we're saying, let's go talk to your primary care physician or your neurologist, somebody with an eye for some of these inappropriate medications needs to look at this and see which ones can we wean you off on. Do you have to mm. be on all of these medications? Because they really do have some policy polypharmacy effects. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I always like to think about, you know, when your older adults start acting really differently, right? Mm-hmm. They're like maybe wandering mm-hmm. more or they lose more memory. And then you're like, oh, they have a UTI. We need to fix that, right? Right. Like, mm-hmm. That's well, that was in my, my lesson that I learned about was the difference between delirium and dementia. Mm. Mm, yeah. Very good. Okay. Very nice. Yeah, <laughs> there is a major difference between them. Some people get the three Ds confused, depression, delirium, and dementia. So it's really important that behavior analysts out there know what the signs and symptoms are for each one of those, because I've had so many people say, oh, that's just a dementia symptom. When Amanda and I will say, no, this is a sh- this is, looks like delirium and we need to get this mm. checked out ASAP. For folks at home, can you briefly share just like the general de- differences between those terms? Oh, sure. So delirium is a medical issue. It has an acute onset, it happens almost immediately. You'll see, you'll start seeing these behavior and psychological symptoms within a day to a week of, you know, it could be a UTI, it could be polypharmacy, it could be dehydration. There's, we have like a little anagram. There's diet, dehydration, heart failure, organ failure, I should say, prescription drugs, injury, pain, unfamiliar environments, medical procedures, those can all cause delirium. And the only way to fix delirium essentially is by fixing the underlying medical issue. Mm -hmm. So that's very Mm -hmm. different than dementia, which is the slow, progressive change in a person's neurology. And it's basically, you know, the the slow death of brain cells. And depending on which kind of dementia you have, because there's over 70 different types, Alzheimer's is just one type. It will, the stages will look different. The symptomology will look different. The progression will look slightly different. So delirium and dementia are very different. Part of the issue with misdiagnosing dementia versus depression, because that's the other D, is that there's the symptoms are similar, right? Mm -hmm. When someone's depressed, they're less interested in activities, they're more lethargic, they... I mean, and those those symptoms itself overlap with those are also symptoms of dementia. And so sometimes it's difficult to kind of pull those out. And so looking at, does this person have a history of depression? Okay, then we really, we probably need to rule that out first before we're just saying this person has dementia. So ruling out the medical of delirium and then ruling out the mental health of, I'm sorry, of depression and then looking into dementia. That's a really great point. And again, you know, behavior analysts don't do this, but it's really important that we know this path because oftentimes we're kind of guiding our caregivers and families through this healthcare system that is so tangent and you think that it's built for the consumer, but it really isn't, especially if you're an older adult. So when you're thinking about your day as, as you know, behavioral gerontologist or behavior analyst working in, in gerontology, can, could you sort of quickly describe kind of what that might look like? Because it seems like you have, you know, there's 70 types of dementia, which means that if you had 70 patients with dementia, you could have 70 very different trajectories. You know, are you doing more work with the individuals, with their family or say nursing staff? 
Do you have to collaborate with lots of different professionals knowing that there is this medical model that's already in place? Are there kind of common tasks you find yourself doing? You know, these are true for almost every case, or these are some common issues that come up that we tend to work on a lot more. I kind of just love to get like a big picture in what, what a day might look like. Well, I think you described a lot of our big picture, actually, all of the above, everything that you just mentioned, we are doing. So we do a lot of training, a lot of training professionals in the field of gerontology, the older adult themselves, sometimes that might be self-monitoring training. Maybe we're working with the family members like the spouses, adult children, siblings, family, friends. We could be training the paid caregivers who are there working with them in their home, or we're going into communities like nursing homes homes and assisted living facilities. We actually have a training coming up with a hospice agency. We're training other clinicians in the field, other behavior analysts. So we do, a lot of our day involves training. Mm-hmm. And then in terms of the professionals that we're working with, I mean, it's just many, many, many professionals. We could be working with conservators and guardians, doctors, nurses, office managers, and psychiatry PCP offices, neurology, special physician groups, rehabilitation groups. So, you know, working with OT, PT, speech, aging institutes. Then, of course, we're working in the senior living community. So the nursing homes, the assisted living, independent living. We're working with in-home care services and care coordinators. We're working with professional and networking groups like the leading age Alzheimer's groups, Parkinson's groups, hospitals and medical systems, you know, programs that keep people at home instead of coming back to the hospital. We've worked with elder care lawyers, even AAAs, like the area agencies on aging, and each state is mandated to have those. And then, uh, and then finally, we're working with CMS, so the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And there you can work with the program managers to implement demonstration grants and partnerships. So some common tasks that we do, I think I'm going to let Amanda take, tell us a little bit about some common tasks that we do. So we work specifically in dementia care. So our tasks, you know, look really similar to a person in healthy aging. But for us, I bet our daily tasks look similar to your day. We go into homes. We talk about ABA in a simplified way for people to understand. We observe routines. We collect data. We give feedback to families right in the moment. We praise caregivers for their efforts. And then we go back to our computers to record and our data and input our session notes. So it's that so does it's sound not, familiar. Yeah, it's not, <laughs> not, not too similar in terms of the you know, the general gist of a day. It sounds mm-hmm. like a lot of our practices are probably more similar than different. To be honest, I know one question I had in in terms of after kind of looking at the at, at your ethics course and then and then reading the you know kind of reviewing the articles that you shared was it it feels like the targets themselves may not be too different, but there is like this level of idiosyncrasy that goes into sort of looking at these behavioral repertoires just due to how each individual responds to the process of aging. I mean, how do you, is, is there any sort of like quick way to get around that? Or is it really just a matter of the same tasks that you would do for any, you know, behavior challenge or any challenge a family or an individual is facing, just looking at the variables? Or- yes, the family unit, the environment, the context, you know, what are their goals? Some families want to move their loved one out. They cannot stay at their home. So we're writing transition programs. Some families want to keep their loved one at home for as long as possible. So we're looking at how do we bring in more resources to that family member? It really is going back to what do you want? How do you want to live out your days? Because how you prefer to live your days are going to be very different than me. So Amanda and I's job is just listening to what they want and translating it into, you know, ABA terms and putting the right checklist, the right TAs into place, a lot of resource gathering for them, and just helping them identify what they can and what they want to do. So many people are kind of wrapped up in this is how I should live my life or this is how my grandparents did it or my mom did it. And we say, okay, let's rewrite the book. You don't have to live like anybody else. You can live however you want and we can help you do that. And 
when working with you know the the fam with the family, how much are you able to work with the individual client? I mean, is it? I assume that is going to be a factor on to, you know how how far their dementia has progressed in terms of how much they're able to add to the conversation, or is it something that you are are able to do in different ways? Maybe not through uh, interviews necessarily, but through just observing them in their environment. Like I'm curious how that kind of breakdown comes into sort of like you were talking about with what are your goals? What do you want out of this process? Yeah. So like Amanda said, if you're working in healthy aging, it's going to look very different than if you're working in dementia care. So with Amanda and I working in dementia care, if a person is in that mild state or mild cognitive impairment or pre-diagnosis, then we're going to be doing a lot with that individual, a lot of self-monitoring. But if the person is past, let's say, maybe the moderate stage of decline, it's really more about caregiver training, anticipating needs, still setting up the environment for that person, but, you know, more they're dependent. They have more needs that other people have to take care of them. The only thing I was thinking is that where they're living will play a big part in that too. Mm -hmm. So if Mm -hmm. a person's being at home and they're living alone, I mean, I can't rely on anybody to Mm -hmm. be implementing a behavior program. So it'll be all self-monitoring. So as a person is progressing or declining in their dementia and their care is becoming more restrictive. So moving from, you know, home to an assisted living where there is some staff involvement, but certainly, I mean, they're basically just checking on a person. So there's going to be a lot more self-management there, but then moving into a memory, memory care facility, then I can kind of pull back more of the self-monitoring, which is probably not working as well anymore and rely more heavily on the staff to implement programs and to skillfully prompt and arrange the environment in a different way to promote skills. I know one thing that I learned in, in the course in terms of ethics in dementia care was how much time is spent on just figuring out who is in charge of the various aspects of the, you know, aged individual's life, their medical Mm -hmm. care versus their financial Mm -hmm. care versus who has power of attorney, which I know is maybe not something all of our listeners, you know, want to hear about because it's not necessarily the reason they got into behavior analysis. But boy, does it seem harder to navigate that with adults than it would be, say, with children, where if you're working with parents, you know, the parents probably are in charge of all that stuff, right? So I'll talk to the parent, they'll they'll know that. But it seems like such a, so many things that could need to be taken into account just for providing care. You're a hundred percent right. And if you get it wrong, there could be some litigation issues. Mm -hmm. So if you're working with someone and you don't have consent from their power of attorney, so that is basically the person in charge of their care. And there's two different power of attorneys. Like you mentioned, it could be power of attorney over finances or over healthcare. And just to, you know, throw you out another one, there's calls a healthcare surrogate. And depending on what state you live in, sometimes they have other terms and there's also guardianship and conservatorship also depending on what state you live in. So it can get kind of tricky. You have to know your state's rules and regulations and who's caring for that individual. And as a behavior analyst, you have to start there because they have to sign your opening paperwork. So I need you to show me that you are the person in charge of this individual that I'm going to work with because we have definitely gotten into situations where families are trying to pit another family member against each other, right? So let me bring in this third party, us, to do an assessment. Well, that's something that we need to know. And are we talking to the right individual? Or maybe there's somebody in the family who you cannot talk to, or maybe maybe it's not a formal rule, but it's quite informal that there's a riff in a relationship. So family dynamics plays a large role in our care plan and the resources that we can provide to the individual. And on top of that, I mean, we're going from a person that was their own guardian, right, Mm. to someone else being in charge of that. And a lot of times we're getting called in during that process. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, making sure that all of all the papers have been signed and that we Mm -hmm. have all of that because 
there's been times where, you know, maybe one of the children is in charge of financial, but not in charge of medical, but Mm -hmm. behavior analysis is kind of both (laughs) really, you know, it falls under both. And so making sure that I have consent from the person themselves and from Mm -hmm. their children and making sure all those papers are in a row essentially Mm -hmm. before I were to get started. So it's the best part of the job is, is what you're saying. All the- <laughs> it's a business part. It's an ethical part. It's a much needed part of the job. Yes. Oh, boy. That must also come into play for things like when, when you're working with families to talk about you know medication and you've got multiple players who are saying they need this medication or that medication. I know, uh, Miranda, the article that you that you co-wrote, I, I found fascinating in terms of just how important medication both is and maybe isn't in certain aspects of dementia care, depending on which kinds of medications, why they're being prescribed, the reasoning behind it. Is that something that is often hard when you're talking about, you know, families or maybe with other caregivers or not even like legal caregivers, but I mean, you know, like medical practitioners when you're talking about behavior versus say, you know, the need for psychotropics to control, quote unquote, control behavior? So it it makes sense for people to take psychotropic medications. I mean, there's as, there's definitely a place for it, especially if that person has a long-term mental health issue, right? So if they've been working on something for a long time, pulling a medication just because they're 70 now, I mean, that's not helpful either. But mm-hmm. If the person has never been on these meds, we really try to explain to families and doctors that it's it's n- maybe not as helpful use of those medications to manage the behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia because of those significant side effects. So BCBA should also be aware that there's a document called the Beers Criteria for Potentially Inappropriate Medication Use in Older Adults. I know it's a very long title, but sometimes Amanda and I will use that list to share with families. And like she mentioned, sometimes even physicians, what may be an inappropriate medication and maybe if you have to put them on a medication, can we try a different form? So maybe not an a psychotropic, maybe an antidepressant or an anti-anxiety. You know, that's really a discussion between the family and the physicians. But Amanda and I like to at least bring to the table some resources to coach families in how to talk about medications with their doctors. Sounds like a very hard conversation to have to have for individuals who are themselves not going through the same process as their maybe elderly parent or elderly family member to talk about the the differences between the types of medication they that they are taking, mm-hmm. pros and cons. Right. And again, it's in a system that we all know. We know about going to the doctor and getting a medication. But we as behavior analysts know that the medication is not going to just treat wandering, right? It's going to sedate that whole person. And And so it's coaching the families to understand that there are significant side effects. In fact, these atypical psychotropic medications, they have a black box warning on it. And there's a label that family members have to read every time they open up that pill bottle that says, if you have dementia, you're at an increased risk of death if you take that medication. So family members have to make that hard decision to give that pill every day. But that's also because there's not enough behavior analysts out there, right? There's not enough of us working within this population, and they just don't know what else to do. It's either have my house ripped apart or give them this medication that might be inappropriate for them. There's really no middle ground for these families. They're really struggling, and they... Mm -hmm. That's why they need more of us out there practicing. Yeah, that's really heart-wrenching to think about it from that Mm -hmm. perspective. Absolutely. But honestly, they really don't know what else to do. Of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I still, I still remember this is a little off topic, but I still remember this show from when I was a kid. It was like a drama judge show. Like I think we're old enough to remember that there was a time when if you watch TV, you just had to watch whatever was on TV. You couldn't like choose your show. It was just, (laughs) this is the garbage that's on. And -hmm. it was this, it was this like court show. It was like a dramatized court show, not even like the people's court. And I still remember this episode where I must have been like, you know, 10 or 11, where the family was trying to keep custody of their aging mother who had dementia or so. I don't remember if they, they were specific, but she was becoming a danger to herself. She was like getting into, you know, bottles and like doing things with yeah. chemicals that was potentially harmful to her. And I still remember at the end, the family lost the case and they were going to take the mother and they're going to put her in a home. And it was, you know, I'm sure it was like terribly acted and just really cheesy, the whole thing. But that just struck me as just terrifying the idea that someone that, cared for me my whole life 
could suddenly be unable to care for themselves yeah. that's so much that they just had to be put in a home. And for a long time, I thought, that's just what happens. You just get too old. You can't take care of yourself. No one can take care of you. And you just have to go to the, the old folks' home, pretty much. So while I'm scared of aging, it is nice to know, in so, so like reading some of the articles, like the Bergio Bergio and, and Miranda, the article you co-wrote, that there are a lot of steps that can mm-hmm. happen in between dramatized court show removal from the home. So I was very happy about that. Yeah, that's worst case scenario. <laughs> yes, that sounds like. Where was the behavior of- analyst on that show? I don't. They didn't yeah. show up. I don't know. Yeah, it sounds like a power of attorney was not delegated early on, and the courts had to get involved. It, like Amanda said, that does sound like a worst case scenario. And also, Robert, how traumatic of you to see that and to associate this is what aging is like. I mean, it really mm-hmm. makes sense why people think aging is just the worst thing because our culture the TV shows, how we talk mm-hmm. about it with our friends and family, it really shapes up these internal fears that we have. Well, I don't have the footage to show you so that you can tell me what the treatment should have been. <laughs> Maybe we could talk generally about, you know, are, are there areas of treatment that do have a lot of research and they get some reliable results? I know I know you mentioned to sort of, you know, maybe self-monitoring if you're sort of in early stages of, of dementia care, but what are some kind of common practices that tend to have the most research behind them and tend to be the most effective for a variety of clients? Well, I would argue you can pick out almost any topic and you can find publications on them. It might not be in ABA. You might have to look, broaden your scope and look at journals outside of ABA. There's a whole field called applied gerontology. And that's where we've seen a lot of our interventions published by non-BCBAs. So it's out there. You just have to look a little harder. Some some examples of of ones that 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 you find more effective like i think environmental arrangements came up a lot I, yes, that, that sounded I was like one that was that. And pretty much every client that we've worked with every home that we've been into any assisted living nursing home independent living we've been into we have to tackle environmental enrichment because so many times older adults are not doing anything. No one's paying attention to them. Their environment is so deprived. And then surprise, surprise, it leads to some challenging behavior because they're trying to get access to attention or tangibles or edibles. Yeah. So once we implement some really basic, easy antecedent-based interventions, we just change that environment around, whether that's moving chairs proximity of people, Mm -hmm. teaching staff what to actually talk about with these older adults, it can have a significant quality of life impact on the seniors that we serve. Amanda, are there there any that you you know, typically see recommended a lot or that you yourself find are often a a good component of a treatment package? I think that most often when we go in, so it'll, we'll rule out environmental enrichment and make sure that they're getting enough proactive attention and that they have enough activities. And then it's going to be really looking at skillful prompting and maintaining independence. So it's going to be like, it's going to be looking at how does staff and family interact with this person to promote helpful behavior, but then also how can we maintain skills for as long as possible for this person to be as independent as possible in many different areas, right? So that's because if you think about total care for a person, that's going to be very, very difficult to maintain in a home or in an assisted living. So teaching the staff how prompt hierarchies, how to use even visual and textual cues, as long as, you know, those still function as cues for that person, how to fade back their support. Because many times in the Bergio article brings this up too, that it's just so much easier to just do it for that Mm -hmm. older adult instead Mm -hmm. of, you know, fading back and promoting, you know, using less hand over hand guidance and providing that verbal prompt or doing the gestural prompt. But what we've seen is that once we teach staff these prompt hierarchies, what they report back to us is that it is actually faster in the end than doing it for this person. It's just a matter of getting them on board and teaching them the skills so that they know, no, you don't have to do the whole routine for this person. Watch what they can do and then only provide as much support as needed for them to maintain that skill or get the skill completed. Mm -hmm. So as Amanda was talking, I actually thought of one more too. I mentioned 
earlier, Lou Bergio's Reach Program and Linda Terry Star Program. And if you look at the innards of both of those, what it really comes down to is teaching caregivers the basic ABC analysis. If we just teach staff members and family members the basic environmental influences, the antecedents, behaviors, and consequences, to look at behavior in that context, it can have significant decreases in challenging behavior because it draws awareness to the environment, to how staff or family members are talking to that individual, and what are they doing? What are their responses after? It makes them anticipate needs in the future a little bit better. So really just teaching basic ABC analysis to caregivers is a well-documented in the literature. Mm -hmm. Sure. That, that actually... Sounds a lot like, I mean, I know some of those recommendations were in, in, in the articles that we read, but the, the example, and I think it was in, in your, in your article, Miranda, of mm -hmm. the individual who's been given a bunch of psychotropics because they're wandering, mm, which sounds yeah. kind of, you know, so pejorative. I'm, I'm assuming it means they're wandering, like they don't know where they are. Mm. But then when you look at the analysis of their behavior, you had, you know, the example of, well, one gentleman just, that was usually when he did his normal, you know, his daily walk. Mm -hmm. And that just, he just wanted to get out and walk. And one lady was wandering to like a nail salon where individuals spoke her her primary language, you know, the language she, she knew when she was growing up. And so it was more comfortable for her there. Were, were those examples sort of like from real life? I mean, sometimes is yeah. it that easy of like, oh, this thing that I've labeled as this horrible thing that my poor adult pated you know mother is wandering around really just coming down to well look at the consequence it's it there's a very yes. like logical reason this is all happening and we can make a plan to meet that function yes those are all real life examples that either happened with a, a client of claudia's or myself when we wrote that paper and it really just shows the importance of looking at function when you're looking at any kind of behavior and wandering in particular, a lot of people define it as aimless walking. And Amanda and I never call it aimless. We just don't know the aim of it yet. And maybe the senior right. themselves don't know the aim of it that right at that point. But the more you watch and observe and maybe experiment with some different environmental influencers, you can identify what that aim is. There is a function to that walking around. That was very interesting because I know I, I've had some some colleagues who've had elderly parents and mm -hmm. you know some some going through kind of similar you know challenges related to either dementia or Alzheimer's, and you know that wandering just keeps coming up, and it just sounds mm -hmm. like. It's, it's kind of a, it, not from the individual, but like other doctors or folks will mention, well, they're wandering all the time. Like mm -hmm. it, it just sounds like very angry, almost angry at the individual for, for moving around, which they did all the time before they were in geriatrics and nobody told them, you can't wander. Stop that. They just said, oh, you're going somewhere. You're doing something right. That, that's, that just seems very. You, you feel know, like there's like an ageism component to it. Yeah. yeah may, I mean, maybe, maybe that's going too yeah. far, but I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe that is, is really just an ageism component. I don't know. What, what do you both think? Is that, I, I mean, I don't, I don't want to you know, have you step on any toes of folks who, who've said that in your presence <laughs> before, but I mean, is that something that could just be chalked up to sort of an ageism of that, that level of movement? I mean, I, what brings to mind about wandering versus other behaviors is keeping a person in one space and the safety mm -hmm. risks, right? So mm -hmm. I can see why this is a priority for families and doctors and caregivers. But in the end, as behavior analysts know, I mean, behavior is communication. This person isn't going to do something randomly. There is an absolute reason. And it's, un it's teaching everyone around us that just because this person is confused or they have some confusion doesn't mean there's no purpose to this. Mm. It is total, it's not, that is not going to be the reason. It's going to be because this person wants to exercise. They're looking for someone, something, something to eat, maybe even just to get out of their apartment, trying mm -hmm. to find a familiar environment. So that's less confusing than the nothing that's happening in their apartment. Mm -hmm. It comes back to commu behavior is communication every time. Mm -hmm. I would challenge you to look at the environment and the the what the staff or the family wants. So a lot of times we see that when the client is dependent on someone, that caregiver just wants someone to sit here, be quiet, don't do anything, don't move. And so when they do get up to move around, oh gosh, we have a problem. This older mm. adult is moving mm. around and they're not sitting here and being good for me. Yeah. <laughs> We might see that in other fields too. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> Good point. Yeah. Uh. And I think, Rob, the other thing you're responding to is that it's being defined topographically as mm. problematic without knowing mm. the function, mm. right? No, I just brought up all this terrible trauma from that TV show, and I'm just—it's all really upsetting going me now. Through a lot in this episode. Wow! Oh man, I didn't think this one was going to be the one that did it to me, but <laughs> apparently. So, Bergio and Bergio bring up the fact that behavior analysis needs to needs to needs to get into gerontology more. Mm-hmm. It's mentioned again, right? In, in your article in 2015, you mentioned it. As, you both of you mentioned it as something that comes up a lot as sort of you were going through your own professional development and getting more and more into the field. Are we in a better place in 2022 or 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 not with behavior analysis and with appropriate services in gerontology? No, because we just don't have enough behavior analysts in the field practicing and changing the paradigm or showing an alternative to what's available right now. And that's really one of the main reasons why Amanda and I wanted to put out some CE trainings for BCBAs because... We do think that this can change in that people, behavior analysts, they just need some coaching. And I think it's awesome, too, because if you ever were wondering, it's hard to find it, right? Because you mentioned some people, right? But that they're not like, ooh, I see them everywhere, right? Like mm-hmm. lurking, lurking at conferences, right? It's kind of a hard thing to find. And so I love that you've made it more accessible. I mean, and in addition to kind of increasing competency through through things like trainings, through reading, you know, the, the literature, and you mentioned a whole bunch, and then you know, certainly, you know, we'll link to the to the website where you have the kind of the intro <laughs> course, and then the the articles and references that folks can look at. I mean, are there any other good steps that you would say, folks who are interested, maybe they're in graduate school and they're similarly not interested in going working in the school system, they'd rather work with a, a we population. Need people, we need people everywhere. We need people everywhere, but yeah. I'm just saying, it's specifically this episode, the ones who are not interested they listened to all our other episodes they said no not for me that episode 56 and you know 200 whatever this one is 200 something those are the ones i want to do that what should they be also doing for competence other than just reading literature i mean should they be finding jobs in locations where seniors are served and sort of doing all the jobs or is that something they might not need to do you know uh, just focusing on the behavioral piece is, is where they need to focus well if you're one of these listeners and you have read the articles and you have attended workshops in senior care or dementia care and now you're asking yourself what's next we say go out there and get your feet wet and start working with some seniors but do mm-hmm. so with the supervision of a veteran in the field And we need to emphasize the need for supervision. After you do the online training and attend seminars, you need to practice under the supervision of an expert or a veteran in the field. Case by case, we need to build the skills of our BCBAs. And if you're a behavior analyst that's been working in the field for 10 plus years, then you have the skills in assessment, caregiver training, and interventions. You just don't know senior care. And that's what you'll need help in navigating at first. The supervision systems are already in place for autism and developmental disabilities. The skill sets become established in assessment and treatment programs when you go into senior care. When you go into senior care, you should not be practicing the skills of our services, of our science. You should be practicing, you should, I'm sorry, you would be practicing the skills you know and then generalizing them to a new population. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We also want to say that we think that there's a little room to be liberal in who's your supervisor in gerontology because we simply do not have enough BCBAs practicing in gerontology to supervise the hundreds, hopefully thousands of BCBAs out there interested in breaking into this field. We think that if BCBAs have, let's say, 10 or more years in their career, and maybe their supervision could be run by an RN, a registered nurse, or a longtime executor, executive director in senior care, or even a social worker, someone who has been in senior care for 10 or more years themselves, and, it, and an expert in their area, because gerontology is really just so interdisciplinary, and those mm-hmm. other fields give us such rich information about the medical and healthcare issues of seniors that VCBA simply don't know, because that is just not our expertise. I was going to ask, because I know you know, in, in response to the question about, uh, do we have are things better? Amanda's no made it seem like it's probably not going to be like, oh, just, you know, go around the corner to any assisted living community. I'm sure there's a BCBA there who's just waiting to supervise, you know, no. eager young students. So 
it's good to know we have a l- little bit more leeway if, if you're deciding to get into the field and you, you can't quite find a behavior analyst who's who's there to, to back you up there. But I do think just around the corner is a BCBA interested in getting into gerontology. And that's what keeps us very hopeful and optimistic. They just need a little bit more training and some supervision. And we think that there are definitely pathways out there for you. Other than the, you know, the, just the number being small, are there any other barriers to behavior analysts moving into the field? I mean, when we think of aging, I mean, I don't think a year goes by that there isn't some article published about we're going to have more seniors in America than we have anyone under, not a senior. And, and that just, that sounds like a group <laughs> that is ripe for needing all the services, you know, mm-hmm. in terms of looking at, say, like outside, you know, financial interests even. Just, we, we know this is going to be a, a crisis if we don't get more people involved. Are are there other barriers that I'm totally missing? Yes. And let me just say that 2035 is the key year that you're talking about, that we are going to have more older adults than people less than 18 in our country, which is a definite big time paradigm shift in our social care industry. But there are many barriers to getting into gerontology. I think the biggest one is that people don't know about ABA in gerontology. So Amanda and I have to explain what is ABA, what does observation entail, what are we recording? The biggest initial step with families is getting used to people coming into your home. Because if you look at their standard model of care, older adults are going to clinics, they go to appointments, they go out into the community to receive services, and not many people are coming into their home. And the same can be said for a senior living community. Assisted living and nursing home management are not used to having these service providers come into their community to give feedback to their staff members about what they're doing or how they're influencing behaviors. So a general hurdle for us in the field is that we don't have a proof of concept or a glaring example of what is ABA and dementia care, but we really feel like we're still building that. Another major barrier to treatment is the funding aspect. So we are a private pay business, which excludes a large portion of seniors who want services, who need services, and they deserve our care. And then past the funding, the barriers we see are common in any other field when you're working with humans. For example, staff turnover, we see that in any and all social service fields, including aging. But why do our direct staff burn out so easily? Well, we really think that social service agencies are just not equipped to prioritize the wellness of our caregivers. This is a cultural phenomena that is playing out across America. We see it in school settings, in intellectual and developmental disability homes, and in senior care. Another barrier we wanted to mention would be around illness and diseases. These events will significantly change the trajectory of a care plan. It's not that it wouldn't change in for a child or an adult care plan. It's just more that an older adult are at a much higher risk of getting sicker than those other populations. And it's not really a barrier to treatment. It's more something a BCBA needs to consider when providing services. So true. Well, I think we've come to the part of the show where we're going to be entering the dissemination station. <sighs> Where we have lots of priority seating and special play. <laughs> you're never wandering on our train. You know, there's a purpose. You're, you're coming to the station. That's why. I'm here with so, my petticoats again. <laughs> so I think one I'm of having the, a pumpkin pasty. Oh, you too. You too with your <laughs> old timey references. <laughs> <laughs> So one of the one of the challenges with an episode like this, which we have not done many episodes on this topic, so to say like sum up behavioral gerontology in one or two <laughs> sentences, not really fair to our, our, our great guests. So I, I guess the bigger question would be, where do you see behavioral gerontology in ten years? You know, what do you think? What what are the things you are are optimistic about, and what are the barriers that maybe other folks who aren't actively going to be pursuing the, the field could do to sort of help promote more of our colleagues kind of getting into the field? Well, I think that we saw such a big change in ABA and autism because parents were advocating for these services. And I would urge those same parents and family members who have children, they probably know a senior out there 
who has some needs that are not being met and that a behavior analyst can play a role in that person's life. So hopefully we get more community members advocating for gerontology, ABA in gerontology. And we really honestly hope that more people can get into the field using these CE courses so that way they feel like they have a bit more knowledge, gain a little bit more courage to go out there in the field. I guess my biggest dream is that we have one behavior analyst in every assisted living, nursing home, independent living, and we also have community behavior analysts working in homes, that we have, quote, early intervention services for dementia care, that we just see the creativity and the scope that behavior analysts can cover because there are so many different behaviors that you can specialize in when working in senior care. That was really inspiring, Miranda. Mm, Thank you. And that people see the joy in aging, to be quite honest, because in other cultures and communities, we celebrate our seniors and they should be celebrated. They have lived 70, 80, 90 years. Wow. I mean, to see that many sunrises and sunsets, it truly is inspiring. I love working with this field because they just, the amount of growth I feel personally from hearing their stories, seeing how their lives have changed, what have they affected in their communities and their culture. And it really gives me, you know, it fills my cup so I can keep going in this field. Amanda, how about you? Anything anything different, different areas? You know, I don't know if I could say it better than Miranda. I was, <laughs> uh, the only other thing I was thinking is not just applied or not just kind of the clinical end of things, but just how exciting research could be that Mm -hmm. there is, I mean, the, I mean, the sky's the limit really in terms of what a BCBA could be researching and learning about. I mean, one topic that comes to mind that we really do need to have more information about is even just verbal behavior. You know, a lot of research has, we've completed a lot of analysis and understanding man's and tax and interverbals and how, how those start and how to build those skills. And, but in the senior population, we're looking at losing those skills and there is a lot less research on what that process looks like. Mm -hmm. Like which operants do we lose first, which operant Mm -hmm. maintains for a longer period of time. And those answers can really have an impact on our clinical practice and the research is needed. So I think that, you know, separate from the clinical end of things, I think that there's just, I mean, lots and lots of areas that BCBAs could be just understanding behavior at that ground level. That, I, I, it was one of the questions that I, I, I felt like we sort of covered a little bit, but now that you bring it up, Amanda, are there any sort of research areas where, oh, this treatment or, or this package, just the gold standard for children that, you know, you, you've you seen or worry, like, I don't think that's going to work for adults beyond sort of, you know, the use of maybe more immature or, or, or childish, you know, reinforcers. Is there anything that jumps out as like, I don't know if that's going to, like, it sounds good for young people. It might work for adolescents. It's not going to work with senior citizens. I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is anything that's going to be a long-term consequence. So any sort of token economies usually don't work with someone with dementia. Now, someone younger or just you're working on healthy aging sort of things, then sure, sure. But that one is definitely anything that's just solely consequence-based or that uses things that mean something else that will just kind of add to the confusion. The first one that comes to my mind is escape extinction. We rarely recommend escape extinction because, you know, think about it for eating. If a person is not eating, to hold a spoon up to somebody's, a senior's mouth and just wait for them to take a bite, it just looks socially inappropriate. And it it also is just not a good intervention. There's so many other ways that we can increase a person's eating skills. Overcorrection is not good with older adults. Anything where you actually have to put a hand on someone, hand over hand guidance is probably not good for older adults. One, it doesn't look good. It looks socially inappropriate. But two, they truly are so fragile. They bruise so easy. You can break a bone so easily. And, you know, it's it's about doing no harm, right? And we have so many other good interventions out there that we can be using besides ones that you have to put hands on an individual. 
Well, thank you both for sharing that. That is good. It, it, it's there's so many facets, so much to learn. So I'm not going to get to all of it <laughs> today, but fortunately, we've got places if folks want to hear even more. They have a place they can go and they can get even more content related to behavioral gerontology. So before we wrap up, I would love Miranda and Amanda, if you could just kind of share out that web address and any contact information where folks can go to learn more, or maybe even to take, take your courses. Absolutely. It's www.abilities.today slash learn. And you'll see a link to all the six CEs that we have out right now. And hopefully 2023, we'll be publishing some more out there. Hey, can I ask you a quiz question? Where would behavior analysts practice in geriatrics or gerontology? Gerontology. Gerontology. Very good. Geriatrics is medical. Very good. Medical aging. (laughs) Hey, that's the, I asked the questions on this show, Miranda. What? Go. I went, when I took when I took your course, I answered those questions. All right, that's, that's not. I wasn't prepared. <laughs> no, you don't like it, do you? The tables are turned. Yes, you're right. I'm so sorry. I'll never invite anyone on the show again. I've learned my lesson. <laughs> no, it was a fair. It's a fair good. question. It's good to remember these things. It's good yeah. to remember. We've got a lot of notes. Got a lot of things we talked about. So thank you. <laughs> yes, I know that I've made that mistake in the past. So I'm glad that we made that clarification. Well, Dr. Miranda Traha, Amanda Ripley, thank you so much for coming on the show. We really appreciated your time tonight. And we hope our listeners have learned some more. And we hope we've inspired a few folks. I know we've got some graduate students listening to think about, you know what? I don't know. I might be changing my area of interest. All right. Come on. That would be nice. Come on over. (laughs) If if that happens, email us and we'll we'll tell everyone your name and 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 so so they know you made the switch. (laughs) (laughs) Wonderful. Once again, big, big thanks to Dr. Miranda Trahan and Amanda Ripley for coming on the show and talking to us all about this very, very important topic. And like we said, we do hope a number of you listeners, especially those folks who are either early in their career or are in a graduate program, do think about joining the ranks of behavior analysts working in gerontology. It is very needed field. And I you know, would love to hear from folks who either are starting in that field, or we'd all love to hear that, folks who are starting in the field or who are thinking of entering the field of what your experiences have been like. I think it's going to be very, very important for what you, wherever you live that we have qualified individuals, as many qualified individuals as possible, serving a population, which, let's be honest, almost all of us are going to be in at some point in some form or another. All right. Well... We want to thank all of you so much for listening to ABA Inside Track. We'd really appreciate it if you rate and review and subscribe to the show. There are a couple other ways you can support us. Certainly, you can go find some of our social media posts. We're on all the socials as ABA Inside Track. You can go to our website, abainsidetrack.com, to find links to all of the articles discussed on this episode, as well as to get links to the courses that uh, Miranda and Amanda were talking about, and to find places to purchase CEs, if you are so inclined, as well as all of the episodes we've ever done. If you want even more ABA Inside Track content, including discounts and access to exclusive episodes that you're not going to be able to necessarily get in the free feed anytime soon, go to patreon.com slash ABA Inside Track, where you can subscribe for as low as $5 a month to get all the episodes ahead of time, to get access to our live episodes and voting for our extra long book club podcast. We've got one coming up pretty soon as you are hearing this. We're going to be talking about Between Now and Dreams, which is a book on parenting for parents of autistic children. So we really hope you are interested in that. And if you subscribe at our premium $10 level, you'll get access to that episode right away when it comes out, I believe later this month, as well as two additional CEs for no further charge. Again, that's patreon.com slash ABA Inside Track. We also want to thank some folks who help make this podcast what it is, and that it would be Dr. Jim Carr for recording our intro and outro music, Kyle Sturry for creating our interstitial music, and of course, Dan Thabit of the Podcast Doctors for his fabulous editing work. And finally, our last secret code word, sun, S-U-N. You know, that big ball of gas in the sky that gives us heat and light? We need it to survive, folks. It's the sun. We'll be back next week with another full-length, fun-filled episode. But until then, keep responding. Bye!